请我们第一位的讲者进行第一场的主题演讲。讲者是新加坡 c o u n s e l o r 执行长张福强先生。c o u n s e l o r 是一家全球创新设计公司，为企业重新设计经营模式与组织模式，透过合作与创意，让企业在盈利与社会影响力等两方面都能永续发展，帮助企业迎接挑战，度过难关。c o u n s e l o r 目前服务的企业许多，包括大企业，例如 Sony， 以及许多中小企业、家族生意。亚洲政府以及 NGO， 现在让我们掌声欢迎张福强执行长。台湾的朋友，早上好。我十九年前，当我十九岁的时候，我那时候啊、呃，在这台湾的南部，对，我是阿兵哥。所以刚才呃院长所说的一切呢，我已经经历过了，因为。我在你的美丽的山上爬来爬去，因为我们当兵的要要学怎样用那个呃 map 啊、呃，要找那些地方。但是台湾，我们台湾的朋友真的是很好。当我们找不到地方的时候，他们每次说在那在那，我看到很多人去那边。而且你知道现在新加坡红的是什么吗？我们喜欢吃那个台湾鸡扒。你知道为什么那个台湾鸡排很好吗？那个台湾鸡排好是因为很多人在台湾当过兵。<笑>当我们新加坡的时候，十八十九岁的时候去台湾当兵的时候呢，一定有吃过台湾鸡排。所以现在在新加坡，在每一个百货公司一定有，如果有台湾鸡排卖的时候，人家一定 long queue。好，所以很高兴，很荣幸，呃，被邀请到来这边分享我们的经验和且我们的 experience。所以呃，有如果呃有什么很像不顺畅的东西，请多多指教，啊，呃，因为我们现在的主题呢，啊、呃，需要很多很仔细的经济还有商业的讲解，所以我也是需要你原谅我，我的中文我听得懂，有可能你听不懂，<笑>我的我的妻子每次说，你的中文呢？你你要进步多一点，不然我们的女儿呢，改次的的中文是半桶水，哦，所以我现在也是来到台湾，我很高兴我有这个机会，啊、呃，多多用我的中文来多多进步，好、哦、，so， 啊、呃，对不起，所以我现在要用呃英文，啊、呃，如但是如果你有什么，呃，你你觉得还是听不很清楚，或者我讲的太快，因为有时，呃，我在演讲的时候，人家说我很像那个什么日本的那个 bullet train。<笑>而且今天的题目我们有，呃，包括的的 coverage 蛮广的，所以也是需要你多多包涵啊。Thank you very much. So today, uh, I'm going to only share three things. Uh, the first theme is what we call an economy that unites. The second aspect is what we call an enterprise that unites. And the third thing is an, identi an identity that unites. First of all, for those of you who are thinking of starting a social enterprise, you know we are here in Kaohsiung. Uh, this is a city for the brave. So if you are going to start a social enterprise, you must be very brave and a little crazy. So you must give yourself a round of applause because it's not easy. But as somebody once said, only the crazy ones can change the world. That is Steve Jobs, right? So if you are not crazy, and if you are not thinking different, then the world will remain as it is. And we all, we all must come to a very、uh, realistic conclusion that the world is at a crossroads. The current economic model is actually not practical and sustainable for the long for the long run. So we have to do something practical and meaningful. Because if we fail to do so, if there are not enough people who are crazy enough to put their lives and their own financial future at stake in order to contribute to a more sustainable world, then the world as we know now will be lost. So this is just a broad idea of what 
I intend to share uh, this morning. We can say that the world economy is divided into two models, and we are always dealing with this tension since the beginning of times. One model is the exploitation model. Since the industrialization period, it has always been on the basis of exploitation. Where are the, where are the highest number of resources at the cheaper price? Let's go there. Who has the lowest paid workers? Let's go there. And then we upsell to the places who can pay more for it. Do you, for the ladies, uh, do you know where most of your clothes are manufactured? Most of your clothes are either are manufactured in places like Bangladesh. But do you know that if I turn all your brands and I tell you and I use a Bangladeshi name, none of you will pay more than 10 times for the price of manufacturing. That, that, that is the paradox that we are dealing with. It is made in Bangladesh. It is beautiful and perfect in Bangladesh. But yet we will not pay more for it the moment we put the label of Bangladesh on it. You understand? This is, this is, this is actually the reality of, of the current uh, model. Now, the other model that is emerging is what we call an economy that unites. That economy requires us to respect the potential of every place, whether in your perception is the poorest of places, even the poorest of places in the world has potential. Right? So it's two models, and there is this, what we call, movement towards an economy that divides, towards an economy that unites. Kiara Lubing, uh, whom some of you know because she was in Taiwan in 97, 98, she received a doctorate from Fujian University, went to Brazil in 1991. And as she was flying uh, and approaching Brazil, she saw what, what was known, what is known popularly as the crown of thorns. That means in the midst of this rapid development that Brazil is experiencing with all the beautiful skyscrapers, there were all these favelas, the slums. And Kiara in her mind was thinking, we, we see this reality for years, for years. Is there not something that we can do to overcome this divide between the rich and the extreme poor? And so in 1991, she launched the project of the economy of communion, which my company is part of. It's a worldwide network of, of people, not just entrepreneurs, who are trying to shape uh, a new economic system. Now, let, allow me to explain what is an economy that unites. The computer is not uniting with me. <laughs> you need to give it time. It's warming up. I didn't say. Okay. The concept of the economy of communion, its sole purpose is to overcome poverty and inequality by spreading the culture of giving. Do you know that we actually have enough food to feed the world? Right now, we actually have enough food to feed the world, but we still have 30 to 40 percent of the world not fed properly. That is also another unfortunate truth. Yeah? So we have it, but we are not doing it. That is why this world is always so crazy. You know, it's, it's quite incredible. And the other aspect is sharing profits. Profit, my dear friends, is not a bad thing. If you are trying to do a business and you constantly don't make profit, you shouldn't be in business. But the problem is how you use profit. You understand? Because sometimes when we serve NGO and we are not interested in making profit, then I go like, oh my goodness, then you're not interested to be sustainable. <laughs> you know what I mean? You must make profit. But the problem is not profit. The problem is people abuse profit. People abuse profit to support oppressive systems. You understand? So we must have a clarification because sometimes, sometimes people say, oh, profit is no good. Being profit driven is no good. Profit is a consequence. If you do something good, you will surely make profit. If you do something lousy, you will never make profit. Okay? So we have to clarify, profit is not evil, but the problem is the use of profit. Yeah? So this concept of economy, economy, how you share profits. And 
adopt a different organization dynamic. This word is very big, huh? but this is really important. If you want to build a new economy, our biggest problem is what? In development discussions and all these things, we all know, material poverty is not really the biggest problem. People don't have food, people don't have food. It's not the biggest problem. Our biggest problem is poverty of identity. People don't even feel they have value. People don't even feel they have value. And you go to some places in the world where we operate as consultants in a lot of the emerging countries. We tell them. One experience, I was in Bangladesh, and I said, they were all looking up to us, all the speakers from overseas. I said, you guys are very good. Singapore is very successful. And I always tell my Bangladeshi friends, you know Singapore was a slum in 1965. And we were considered a hopeless case. But we managed to do it. So can you. Your country is many times bigger than us. And you know how old is Bangladesh? Bangladesh has almost 6,000 years of civilizational history. 6,000 years. What can you do with 6,000 years? A lot of things. But if you don't even have confidence in your own identity, finish. <laughs> we cannot talk. Then the worst problem we have in development, in improving people's life, is this idea of purpose. How to give them something that they have confidence. Not to just give them money because they need money. Money is the easiest part. But it is very important to ignite. You can do it. You can change the world. Not because, and you shouldn't think because you are poor. But because you are poor, you can change the world. But because you are poor, you are not poor. Because the other problem we have is this construct of, if I have more money, I am better than you. But that is a horrible construct. That is a horrible understanding of how we want to change the world. And this is the struggle that we are always dealing with. The poverty of identity and the poverty of purpose. So, what is the economy of communion? The economy of communion requires everyone. Everyone. It's not just entrepreneurs. It requires government, public servants, to develop policy that support fraternity, that supports helping one another. It is very beautiful what you are doing here in Taiwan, where you are trying to build sharing of ideas, communities. You know, someone was sharing with us yesterday that you are going back to the original time in Taiwan where the farms, they were really like villages. And, and that is a beautiful thing. This is what we need in this world. And then, of course, we need professionals. Not everyone is called to be an entrepreneur. It's fine. But as a professional, as a manager, as an administration, as someone in finance, we can also contribute to a new way of value creation. And of course, we need a whole new way of teaching. We need professors that will teach our kids that less is, is more. It don't have to be more is better. <laughs> you know, if we know how to use responsibly, if we know how to use creatively, we can all profit from it and we can all benefit. So how is this different from the sharing economy? You may have heard the sharing economy. The sharing economy is still exploitative in nature. Because it talks about if you have a house, you have a house, you join this platform, you can, you can lease your house. Or you look at the, the situation in Uber where people are rising in strikes because they are not paid enough. You know, this is a sharing economy. It's still focused on resources. But the economy of communion has this important characteristic. It is focused on treating everyone equally. That means, whether you are someone who is a millionaire, you are just a little boy who is starting out, you are the same. Because you also have the potential to contribute. And the economy of communion requires you to be creative, to involve everybody, based on the principle of mutual res respect and esteem. That means it's very important to see what we call see with new eyes to remove the prejudice you know because we we end up following the labels that is being set currently first world second world third world <laughs> actually it's one world you know but we give in very easily to these labels right and every aspect is interconnected that means if uber were to adopt the economy of communion method 
it will pay the drivers more and it will give them health benefits. You understand? Uh, so that is the difference between the sharing economy and the economy of communion. So a sharing economy is still resource-centered because it's about scale, growing faster, bigger, with the lowest common denominator. But the economy of communion is relational by design. Considering the relationship of the people involved in the business is very, is very essential. And dear friends, our planet Earth has been suffering for a long time because our current economic framework is resource-centered, profit-driven, pricing, market share, and not relational, which is people, ecosystem. In our, my opinion, if we continue, we are asking for trouble because it's a suicidal and it's an impractical method for development. Some of you may know Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, but the story of Singapore is bigger than Mr. Lee Kuan Yew because there was also Dr. Ko King Sui, we had also Mr. Uh, Raja Ratna, and they were a group of young and idealistic group that decided to try and provide livelihood and employment for an island that actually has no future. But what they chose to do differently was they adopted very realistic uh, market-driven policies but centered on helping the people increase the ability to survive and thrive in the modern economy. That was the biggest difference. So this is Singapore in 1965. I was not there in 1965 yet. <laughs> but I remember the river. We had uh, our Singapore River was so smelly I believe it's smellier than the, the Taiwanese uh, tofu. tofu. <laughs> okay? We used, when I was a kid, and we go by the Singapore River, we all have to do this. You know? Because that was the only way to go past the Singapore River. Then, this is Singapore in 2016. How did a country of nothing, with no resources, hopeless cause, with no possibility of a future, with no land? Because Singapore was a city on an island, literally. It became possible because the Singapore team at that time understood three things. It understood that it has to build a multiracial society. So if you are an Indian, if you are a Malay, you are Eurasian, you are Caucasian, you have a place under the Singapore sun. More than that, the emphasis of making sure, right down uh, to, if Singapore were to build an industrial park, they would think, the industrial park is not there for the, for the businessmen. The industrial park is there to provide employment for Singaporeans. So they move an entire group of people next to the industrial park. So that it's easier for them to go to work, they don't have to pay so much money for the long distance. That was the thinking of the Singapore government at that time. And then, after a while, when Singapore became too reliant on the foreign direct investment, the Singapore leaders thought, if Singapore didn't have enough entrepreneurs who care for Singapore, then our economy will be hijacked by the foreign companies. So Singapore created its own companies, Singapore Airlines, Capital Land. They have to be profitable, they are government funded, but if they are not profitable, they'll be shut down. But the emphasis is to protect the Singapore dream. And that was how people and eco-centered design enabled Singapore to thrive. So, all of you should say, social enterprise thinking is good business thinking. You should never say, social enterprise thinking is not money-making thinking. Because if you do well your social enterprise, you allow more people to make better living. Overall, the net result is always better. No economy will thrive if your poor remain poorer <laughs> and if you don't have a middle class. You know, Tony was making the remark going around Taiwan. You go around Taiwan, it is, you have a strong, you have a good middle class. The middle class is important. You cannot have a situation where people are poorer and poorer. Right? It doesn't make sense. It's not a good economic model.
So now the next thing is that if we want to trigger or we want to support an economy that unites, then we need more enterprises, more enterprises that knows how to unite and not just focus on themselves or, or not just doing business because it's nice to be your own boss, but really a different kind of enterprise model. We can say that the original design of enterprise of a company is to profit the owners. But the economy of communion uh, aim is a profit society. And to tell you the truth, if you are able to do that in the virtual cycle, everyone benefits, including the owners. Because your staff will have a bigger sense of ownership. They will no longer just be staff, they will be partners in your business strategy. From our, from our perspective, our own experience, because we are a consulting firm, when we started many years ago, and we were looking at all the different consulting methodologies, by and large, the major consultancies, they do not support the change in the economic model because it is very reliable contracts. Why do you want to change it? <laughs> the number two, because we also do design. The advertising agencies grow and grow on the basis of media spending and consumerism. There is no intention to reduce spending. <laughs> you understand? So you, you always have to feed the machine. If you stop feeding the machine, the, 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 the business has no more money. <laughs> yeah? So this is the current state of the big consulting, consulting firms. So they need to grow bigger, they cannot grow smaller. <laughs> So, by and large, from our view, the, the, the large part of the consulting world is shaped by exploitative methodologies. That means it's all about maximizing profit at all costs, with cursory consideration for people and relationship. They may say, we do consider, but it's hard because the business is made from how you identify the gaps in the economy and how you maximize profit margin. Yeah? And like I said, profit is not a bad thing. But we need what we call Looking at the potential of profit, we need to look at the potential of persons, people. As I told you, the garment industry is a very good, uh, important example. Right? Most of the clothes are made in Bangladesh, in emerging countries. But if you change the label, you're not going to buy them. You know, th that's, that is why we need to change the, the whole idea of the new economic system. So our struggle was when we started the company, how can, we how can we adopt these methodologies when we don't even believe in them? <laughs> how can we adopt these methodologies of exploitation? You know? And it was a horrible thing because I myself never thought I would actually end up serving in a consulting firm because I wanted to become a priest. That's another story. I will spend another day to tell you. So I didn't become a priest and I ended up doing this. <laughs> so this was a struggle. How to do this kind of consulting business when the whole consulting business is about exploitation? So these are the core partners in the firm. What is beautiful about our group is that we are all from different religion. Some of us are atheists, some of us are Muslims, some of us are uh, uh, Christians, Buddhists. But we, we all manage to share this approach of building a united world through the business. So, this is what we wrote. I just want to say a few lines because what we did when we talk about our charter, all the partners vote line by line. And it has to be, that time we were only uh, four partners. So four over four, uh, four upon four, 100%, every single line. So we want to build a company where unity is a norm of norms and something very unusual. We believe in a company where mutual love exists. This is not normal in consulting firms because consultants are all full of big headed people and mutual love is not very common. <laughs> you know, equal opportunity is an undeniable right. We believe in shared ownership and profit. Some of the smaller consulting firms, they end up becoming, you know, because it's small, you, you run it by yourself. The ownership is not really very open. So what we do is that, for example, our families, 
we try not to get our families involved in the consulting business. We try to open the opportunity for younger consultants to be part of the entire business. And we believe in profit as a means to social equality. The profit, first and foremost, the responsibility of the profit is to the staff. How do you use the profit to help the staff grow their families? How do you use the profit to help them further their career development? How do you make sure the profit helps using the profit to help spread the ideas? How do you use the profit to help the people that you know who are in need in your vicinity? That is the first responsibility of profit. And not just the profit to, to gather and to hoard uh, the profit. That's very important. So yesterday, we just celebrated our 12th anniversary. So fortunately, we survived <laughs> over all these years. So our approach is international, intercultural, and interdisciplinary. So we, because we have consultants from across discipline, there's finance, there's marketing, there's design, um, um, and customer service, retail, and, and things like that. So we needed to create a whole new different way to integrate all the different ideas um, and across all these different countries because we are speaking different languages at times. There's Spanish, there's Italian, there's Vietnamese, there's Malay, you know. So one experience in the early days, just to say how the experience shaped us, we were negotiating for a contract. It's about 100,000 US dollars. And it's been going on for two months. We look like we're going to get it. And this is the early days. Huh? That means if we don't get this job, we don't have other jobs. And so as we are about to sign, the client said, can you do me a favor and increase the fee from 100,000 to 200,000? Okay, then we ask why. And he said that, so that when, we, when you apply for the government grant, I don't have to pay a cent. Yeah? So this is early days. We don't have any other deals. This is the only one deal. So we said we asked for a pause. The partners, a few of us, we discussed. If we say yes, because the, the client said no one will know, because I know many important people in, in the government. Okay? So we said even if no one knows, what are we trying to do? We, 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 better, we better close the, the, the business, you know, if it's not the plan. So we walked away from the $100,000. But walking away sounds easy, huh? Wow, very hard to walk away from the $100,000. Because this meant cash flow for uh, uh, almost like six months because the company was very small. We had nothing. After this, within two weeks, we were still looking around. We got a referral from the Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce. It was for another project. It was for a German company. And because it was a referral from Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce, and they know us, the project was closed very fast. In fact, just within a month. And that amount, that project was $100,000 US. And that was the, this was the project we finished. We did the strategy, uh, we did the customer service experience, and we did the design. So just to say that there were many moments like this that if you want to do an enterprise that's slightly different, you really need to be a bit crazy and brave because you actually do not know whether you will make it and you will be successful. So our social impact formula now, and this we put on the website, our purpose is to transform companies to turn them social. That means big companies, companies that have been focused on being profit-driven, we will go in there, put in a framework, and convert them to be social enterprise. Social not as a corporate social responsibility. Social in terms of a total thinking from how they treat staff, how they treat suppliers, how they look at themselves as a whole economic model. So we, uh, we call our product Purpose Core, and it's very interesting. Many clients have asked us, why do you say Purpose Core? Why not Profit Core? <laughs> you know? And when we explained to them, increasingly, when we first started, some people were a bit wary. They thought we, you know, we were trying to convert them into something. But eventually, a lot of the clients really like it, and they love to use this name that we went through Purpose Core. <laughs> we review and find our purpose, and we can make a difference through business. 
So most of our clients are companies at the crossroad. They want to find growth, they are looking for new ways, uh, but they do not know how, and they do want to make an impact on society. So our methodology is called Unify. So we study the business models, we look at how to create ecosystem, We, we redesign the organization, and a lot of times, we share how we live in the company with, with them. So we use it first. <laughs> we test the product, and how it has helped us, and then we pass it to the company. I will share with you one practice that's quite controversial. Um, and we design what we call unified brand experiences that respects the cultural identity of the country, and in order to bring something that people will embrace. So, if we look at Asia, at least in Asia from my experience, consulting is divided, tend to be in silo. You go from business consultant, and then you have an organization development or human resource, and then you go into design. What we do and what we attempt to do every time is to bring all three at once, at the beginning of every project. So that, because you know, business people don't really like the designers. Huh? When we first started, right, it's like oil and water. So if you ask the designer to start talking about strategy, they think, they think the fellow is, it doesn't know anything about business. So we had to create a kind of experience where it's almost like vinegar and olive oil. So just over, over the last few years, uh, we managed to impact 400,000 lives through all the different organizations. Uh, we count it as revenue, we don't count it as profit. Why? Because this revenue equates to employment equates to opportunities for all the countries where these companies uh, operate. We also create forums like Shape the World Conference in order to share the ideas of a new way of doing business. Again, in a very practical way, but also to suggest to company that it's possible to do it uh, while you're doing business. Then, uh, 2013, we launched this idea of World Company Day. The idea of World Company Day is to invite companies who are really doing this, who are shaping a better world through daily work, the way they treat the staff, the way they work with their suppliers, the way they design products that are sustainable, right? sustainable and meaningful. So what we discovered over 12 years, we discovered that sustainable and society impact type of innovation is the consequence. It's a consequence of deep purpose, care for society, and profound relationship. If a company doesn't have deep purpose, if the goal is more external and not interior, if they don't really care for society and they don't really result in a new type of relationship within the company, they do not shape the world and they don't have what we call transformati transformative unity. So, just to also tell you that the other strange thing is that last year a major uh, survey was done around the world asking people whether they feel that they are global citizen. And 56% of the respondents of this very massive survey, I think they asked about um, almost close to 10,000 people in the world, 56% of the people say, yes, I feel that I am more and more part of a global citizenship. In fact, this is interesting. At the last trip when I was in, in Philippines, Philippines immigration form actually asks you your Facebook account. <laughs> and, and I thought it's very clever because if you are connected on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, you are part of a global citizenship. And also I thought that's particular. And I was telling my Filipino friends that we need to follow the same in Singapore. Because if you put the address, you can't find them. You go on Facebook, you can find them. And if you, if you look at the latest uh, World Economic Forum, and you're talking about the fourth industrial revolution, one of the key things that you will notice about this talk about the fourth industrial revolution is this idea of convergence, this idea of everything coming together. So the challenge for all of us is how can we in business, how can we in our NGOs, 
How can we in government bring different disciplines, different schools of thought together? That is the challenge because our problems are very solvable. Very, very solvable. But we lack unity. That's all. <laughs> right? And And you know, for all the hundreds of companies that we have done in the 18 cities in Asia, we always ask one question. Which value do you feel is the most important to bring the company ahead? And 90%, they always choose unity, teamwork or collaboration. It's one of those words. In all different languages, whether it's Vietnamese, Chinese, Malay, or you know, Hindi or whatever it is, it's always unity. So, So, but this is the, the other paradox. Even though it's greatly desired, most people do not build unity in a practical way, limiting potential and continuing uh, the conflict and financial ruin. Why? Because there's a lack of trust in our organizations. There's a lack of trust between government and people. There's a lack of trust between uh, social economic models. Jack Ma for Alibaba, he was sharing about how he created a platform like Taobao and how he made Taobao successful. One of the things he said that in China, it's very important, the element of trust. If you don't have a system that recognizes that, then it's very difficult to get people to trust each other and create uh, economic success. So it's important, trust. But because there's no trust, nobody bother, nobody bother to update the organization on what to do and what to, how to improve. And, and because nobody tell the share with one another how they should improve and how better ideas should come about, the business models end up becoming more and more inefficient. So again, it's not about the size of an organization. You can have an organization that has 10,000 staff. You can have an organization with only 50 staff. If there's no trust, if it's not designed into the system, no one shares information, then it becomes inefficient. So, from, from our experience, unity is only effective by purpose-driven uh, design. As I said earlier, stagnation and uncoordinated processes, they are all consequence when purpose is not present and unity is not designed. So it's just like a, a land. If you don't do anything to the land, then ultimately it's just not well managed and ultimately it doesn't become something meaningful and beautiful. But if you design with purpose, that means an organization knows what it does. And people also know why they are here. And people believe in it, they evolve. They start to become organic. And the processes become practical. And then the data that they receive, that they learn from doing those projects and they learn from doing those business, starts to feedback in a very reliable way to the organization. So it becomes like a garden. It becomes like a garden. And this is what organizations are. They are not like military structures. In fact, most organizations behave like military structures. But actually, organizations work best like a garden. You have to respect that some people will be big trees. They are leaders. Some people will be just moss. Some people will be small flowers. But all are important. All are important. All are needed. So, if an organization were to be an organization that unites. It has nine very important aspects. First, every organization starts with a product, with an original purpose and a founder. But it is the founder's responsibility to pass on to leaders. And it's the leader's responsibility to pass on to followers. Similarly, the purpose of an organization must be captured as a kind of an idea, a philosophy. And then, that philosophy needs to evolve. And the, the third aspect is a product must have know-how. Know-how means what? That means it must have an insight to something. Then eventually, there will be practice improvement. If an organization doesn't recognize the importance of this nine aspect, an organization dies. An organization simply becomes a cog in the economic system, producing but not creating value. There is a difference between supply and creation. 
If you're always supplying, you're very good at supplying, you do not know how to create purpose, value for society, then you are not really a creative organization. What is a creative organization? People who come to your office, they should not feel drained, but they should go back to their families saying, I learned something today. I learned something about myself. I learned something about my work, and I can give this to my daughter. If you go to work, you don't feel, you feel drained, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know why you're there, please resign. That's what I did. <laughs> and then we started the company. So, if you look at the vast majority, I was in Vietnam, and there was this person who asked me, Lawrence, I go to work, and I don't have purpose. I think I have purpose, but I think my boss has no purpose. And I think I know what to do, but I don't know when I should do it. What should I do? <laughs> then I said, you have already answered yourself. Please do it. Yeah? So, this company was a family-run company. They had many, many different business. Before we came in, they don't even know what the other business is doing. They are just doing. And they don't, don't talk to each other. They don't know what the other business is. It's just growing very fast. So after we did a series of strategy sessions with them, we redesigned the organization. They started to share more. And very interestingly, they understood they can do something for the environment. So they started to do things with using solar panels and all these things in order to create products, in order to bring, bring about a greener environment. Okay, this is one practice that we do. We, do, we call this practice called bonsai. You know bonsai, right? Bonsai, you need to prune, you prune. Huh? So if you're bonsai, if you don't cut it, you look ugly, right? Yeah, so we do it in the company. <laughs> Every year, all the staff, we write about each other. Good point and points for improvement. We don't say bad point. Huh? Good point and point for improvement. So we sit in the circle. So this is my partner and me, and these are the junior staff. So one side is done like this. Because maybe some of you have done 360. 360 for evaluation, right? Your lateral, your peer, and then supervisor down, down up to supervisor. It's not personal, but bonsai is very personal. If you want the person to improve, you have to look at the person in the eye. Say it with love. So this is what we do in bonsai. So for bonsai, the most junior person in the circle start to criticize the most senior person in the company. So, th so they start and criticize me and the partner first. You know, last year, so, so this year my criticism was, Lawrence, you, are, you work too much and you travel too much. So sometimes your email, not very clear. Can you write your email better? So that we understand what you're trying to say. Uh, okay, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah? So you have to listen and you cannot, you cannot oppose, you have to receive. Yeah? Receive. Then it goes one circle, then when it comes to our turn, we have to say for the staff, for the junior staff, how they do. Then after that, everyone has been pruned, right? Then the next part is to, uh, you know, take care of you, uh, you have, how good uh, you have to me, uh, thank you for helping me in the project. So, but you cannot say words of, you cannot just say words, you cannot say things like, last year you were bad, this year you are better. No, you have to say real incident, real things, huh? oh, this event, this project, da 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 da. So we make them write, yeah? so that they don't say nonsense at this thing. And of course, you have to do this with a lot of preparation. So we introduce this to the clients. This is one of the clients doing it. So a lot of clients in, in Singapore, in uh, Vietnam, in Brunei, they started practicing this. And it really helped them because one of the bonsai we did among a, a company of four partners. After they did bonsai, one of the partners cried. They are men, uh, all men, uh, not women. Cried, Lawrence, for many years I've been trying to tell him this. Thank you for facilitating this moment for me to say what is in my heart. You know? So it was very useful to, to unite and bring relationships together. So this company, they, are, they, they sell violins, classical violins. They also, after they have a better unity, they change, they, they move the business model to helping the community. 
So this is the recent Singapore Violin Festival, where they give their time in order to train promising violinists in Singapore. Actually, a number of representatives from, from Taiwan and, and China, they also went to compete and to share experiences in this Singapore Violin Festival. So, just an, uh, one thing that you may be interested to know. Some social enterprises have also asked us to help to look at their business model. What we found in a lot of social enterprises is sometimes the founder, right, he or she is so passionate about the business, only the family member help him or her. But then after that, they don't know how to bring in other people that is not family. So that also becomes a problem. So succession becomes an issue. Then the next thing is a lot of the social enterprise, because they are working on serving the people, which is very important, but they did not devote time for innovation. And time for innovation needs to be disciplined. You need to give 10 to 20% of your time per week, per month. You cannot be once in a while, a blue moon, you ask a consultant, let's innovate. You cannot make a difference. It's virtually impossible. It needs to be by week, by month, 10 to 20%. What are we doing? Why are we doing? Is this helping the poor enough? Is this useful enough? Is this finance enough? You know what I mean? So this is a big problem of a lot of social enterprise. A lot of passion, but no organization. Therefore, it's like a hamster, you know? Hamster running in the wheel, right? Always running, 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 running. And you see a hamster, poor hamster, always running, you know? But going nowhere. <laughs> right? So this is a struggle of a lot of social enterprise. So the last part of this experience, at the end of the day, whether you're social enterprise or your, your enterprise that's trying to be social, it's all about brand. Because right now in the market, there are too many brands. There are too many brands, you know. And we, we have so many more brands now. In fact, there is almost a new brand every, every day. You can count in the numbers on Facebook, on, on social media. You can see they are growing faster and faster because it's so easy to start off with a brand. But the question is, what kind of brand are you? What kind of brand are you? That's important. What do you stand for? And if you are a brand that tries to be many things to many people, then you end up not having a brand. So most brands are like this. They introduce themselves as, I am Lawrence Chong Fook Kiong and I am Singaporean. They, so you do not remember anything. <laughs> most brands are like that now. In fact, you should just say, I'm Lawrence. I believe in unity. Finish. Right? This is the problem. So how do you say it short and how do you say it with impact? So the current model of design and branding, in our opinion, is it is status-led. That means there is expensive brand, there is cheap brand. But what we wanted to do is can a brand identity reflect culture and bring, bring people together? So of course, Over the years, we have been involved with, with many uh, environments. They are very particular and they are sensitive to certain uh, design principles. Because you cannot just design because it's nice. You have to respect the culture, you have to understand the religion, you have to understand the context in how you present the design. Like, just for this uh, identity, we went through an uh, entire one year of review and research just to make sure that we respect Islamic principle. And fortunately, in our team, we have Muslims. Because we have Muslims, we could understand them, right? And then we could work and bring about a new visual identity. Then you have cases like in Vietnam where it's a big struggle to get the Vietnamese to believe that they have a lot of value. Because the Vietnamese like to use French words and they themselves also cannot pronounce. <laughs> right? but, and it doesn't have a lot of value, to be honest. You know? So that is another struggle. How do you convince the emerging countries because even our Western friends, they like Asian brands. That's the funny thing, you know, but our own Asian friends don't like their own Asian names. <laughs> that is the problem. I had to spend a long time convincing the owner, you have to use a Vietnamese name, they use a Vietnamese name, until they said, if a Singaporean is trying to convince a Vietnamese to use a Vietnamese name, there must be something valuable. <laughs> so uh, this company uh, is one of the largest telco in Brunei. Their challenge was, because they have grown so big, uh, they start to have division conflict. Right? They were not really working together. And 
they needed to, to reorganize themselves. So when we started the organization, their, their differences was reflected in their design because this division will have this logo, that division will have that logo. You know, they will all be singing different tune. They are not actually on one song sheet. And the thing is, in terms of the challenge for the country, Brunei is a very small, it's a very small country, but a, there are a lot of young people, and these young people are looking for something different. Because you cannot go to young people and say, this, is, this will give you more benefits. Now, for young people, you cannot just sell features and benefits. You need to sell, you need to present meaning. You need to present purpose. They will ask you nowadays for product. Who are the manufacturer of this product? Where do you get this source of food? Are the farms supporting uh, workers' rights? All these things matter to young people nowadays. So these are some of the research findings that we shared uh, with the organization. So through a series of strategy and evaluation and dialogue session, we involve the staff. And the other thing that's very important is in every project, we try to be the backstage and we try to move the staff to be the ones to share the insights and ideas uh, with the rest of the, the team so that they know it's owned by them. It's not owned by the consultant. And it is very important for the consultant to be willing to, what we call, lose your ideas. If a consultant doesn't know how to lose his idea or her idea and impose his or her idea on the company, that is not the economy of communion approach. The economy of communion approach is to respect even the ideas and to find a way to include those ideas in uh, to the change methodology. So as part of the brand identity, we went to research the, the fabrics and the textures of Brunei. And we looked at the moss. They have beautiful stained glasses in the moss. And they have a national flower called Simpor. And, we want, and it's very interesting. Every, every time we walk, we, we go past this uh, uh, architectural icon, uh, one of the moss uh, minaret towers, they have a star at the top of the tower. And our Brunei friends didn't notice it. But we noticed it because we were trying to find what belongs to them and not something that is, is foreign, you know? And so what we did was, this was the O logo. And we put together five Ds. If you take out one of the D, that will, you cannot see a star in the middle. That was to remind them that you need unity in order to go ahead and it reflected their fabric and Islamic uh, culture. Then from here, it was all converted to here to unify them by culture and by design. So and then we designed an entire new uh, service experience, a concept store, to bring all the division together so they can serve customers uh, as one. So the purpose we helped to work with them was not just to be the best telecommunication provider. You know, some vision statements are quite, in Singapore, we call it, we call it quite the, you know, it's obvious. The means, it's, hello, it's obvious, right? If you say, we want to be the best service provider in the da, da, da country, we provide, we, we aim to avoid the best service. And we go like, it's the, because it's obvious, you are supposed to provide the best service. <laughs> Why do you need to say that in the vision statement? Right? So the whole idea of purpose is to have something more deeper and more meaningful. That means, the purpose of a telco is not just to provide good service, but is to serve as an engine, as a platform to help Brunei transform the economy and to allow more Bruneians to participate in the economic success for the country. Not just to keep the money for the few, but to let a lot of young people in Brunei have a chance to use the company and experience a, a different way of doing business globally. The last example I want to show is uh, we worked on a visual identity for this social enterprise called East Coast in Singapore. They help uh, those people uh, after they have committed crime, the, the, the ex-offenders, we call it, those people who have went to prison and they are looking for jobs. So this was the design solution, but I need to tell you how it came about. When, when, when we started working together, this was their old logo. And I said, the old logo reinforced that they are back in jail. <laughs> you know, 
And they go like, you, because I said, what is the purpose of this course? Oh, to provide employment. It's more than that. Before you can tell an ex-offender to find a job, you know what you need to do? You need to be a friend to the person. Because the person is leaving prison and saying that I have no more chance. And in Singapore, we are a very competitive society. If you have been to jail, it's a black mark, very obvious black mark. It's like you walk around with an icon, you know. Okay? So, first of all, we ask them, what did you really do? They say that we make friends. Okay. So, we changed their tagline. Because their tagline, they have no tagline. They call themselves, they literally write the full name. Industrial and Services Cooperative. Boom. So it's black mark plus look like prison gate and reinforced by one, one bar. That means you're underlined. You know, you are ex-offender. <laughs> so we change that to this. You've got a friend. You've got a friend, right? And the whole idea of uh, almost like a butterfly. This is a time for newness. Renew yourself. Leave it. Leave the past behind. Leave it. And then fly away. Yeah? So... Every, every, so the colors, the yellow, why yellow? Huh? Because yellow by science is one of the most pleasing and neutral colors. Why blue? Blue is a, it's like a whole new ocean, a whole new opportunity for you. So you see, now they started smiling more, you know. Uh, this is one of our ministers. Huh? Yeah, so this is just a family event. They help to bring all the ex-offenders, the families together because they, they try to build a community. So you see, design is very important. If your design is designed for vanity and for status, it's not a design that unites. But if you use a design that can bring people together, it can really shape a better world. So I hope this very simple experience of an economy that unites, an enterprise that unites, an identity can unite, uh, is helpful to you. And thank you very much.